<laughs> That's a little intimidating, Sarah. <laughs> Okay, good evening everyone. I'm Sarah Herda. I'm the director of the Graham Foundation and it's a pleasure to welcome you all here tonight to celebrate the publication of Bowling, Water, Architecture, and Urbanism with a talk by authors and Urban Lab principals, Sarah Dunn and Martin Felsen. It's always exciting when a book supported by the Graham Foundation um, is published, but especially in the case of this book, the first major publication of Chicago-based practice Urban Lab, in other words, a home team. Edited by Ellen Grimes, designed by Thirst, with essays by John McMurrow and Stan Allen, the book explores the concept of bowling as a process, form, and organization set forth by Sarah and Martin to present their work that focuses on architecture, excuse me, it focuses on water infrastructure in American cities. McMurrow begins his essay with an excerpt by David Foster Wallace. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? In this book and in their work, Urban Lab take on the ubiquitous nature of water and its intersection with architecture at a range of scales, from small buildings, industrial districts, to entire regions. The irreplaceable natural resource of water and its value to cities drives the projects collected here. And with this publication, Sarah and Martin make a significant contribution to contemporary discourse on architecture, urbanism, experimentation, environment, and natural resources. After tonight's talk, Sarah and Martin will take a few questions, and then I invite you all downstairs to join us for a reception to celebrate and toast Sarah and Martin. Uh, we'll also have copies of the book on sale, um, and they'll all be 10% off tonight. Urban Lab is an architecture and urban design office co-founded by Sarah Dunn and Martin Felsen. The practice blends design and research to produce uniquely progressive, site-specific projects resulting in a new aesthetic for environmentally resilient architecture, landscapes, and public space. Urban Lab won the AIA College of Fellows Latrobe Prize in 2009 and was selected as an emerging voice by the Architectural League of New York in 2010. They have exhibited at the Venice Biennale and both the first and current Chicago Architecture Biennial, among many other venues. Sarah received her BA from Columbia College and her MArc from the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation at Columbia University. Dunn is also an associate professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Martin Felsen received his BArc from Virginia Tech and MS from Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Pre Preservation at Columbia College. Felsen is an associate professor at the Illinois Institute of Technology, College of Architecture. He serves on the board of Places um, Journal Foundation and Archiworks, and also on the editorial board of Architects Newspaper. Please join me in welcoming Sarah and Martin. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Uh, great to see so many familiar faces uh, in the audience. So we're gonna jump right in to the book. Um, the first thing about the book is that we decided that um, it should be a book about research. And it's a uh, really a research agenda, more than a, let's say, monograph or something of that sort. So that um, kind of gave us, pointed us in the direction that we wouldn't have any built work in the project. It's more like um, maybe we were most inspired by 20th century manifestos that just give you one kind of basic idea through a book, try to prove it in a lot of different ways through experiment uh, and speculation. And it's a lot of the projects that we've been working on over the last several years. We, we thought we'd start with the last page first um, and thank uh, especially the Graham Foundation for supporting the book uh, and being patient while it took a little bit of extra time. Um, and also uh, Ellen Grimes, who's somewhere oh, over here. Uh, if we had, didn't ha had, hadn't had Ellen as our editor, we would still be working on this book. And uh, we're still working with Ellen on a daily basis as marriage counselor. Uh, <laughs> so we thank her for that. Um, so why bowling? Why call it bowling? So the, when we looked through the projects that we wanted to include, all the, bowl, all the projects were bowl-shaped in one way or the other. And that's what we want to try to talk about uh, with you today. So there's three kinds of bowls. Um, the first is a kind of vessel that holds things, especially resources and water. We make it, we construct it, we decide how to physically form it. The second bowl that we'll talk about is one that forms figures. And as architects, we're uniquely interested in, in uh, basically creating 
form, uh, especially that holds uh, resources in our case. The Piranesse's depiction of the fountain here uh, was inspiring in the sense that it, this is not only merging uh, resources, uh, sculpture, architecture, public space, uh, but this is not just a fountain uh, as a beautification project, let's say. This is a fountain that is the water that people were drinking. It's the, it's the point, it's the end point of an aqueduct system. And if we think about a radically different scale bowl, this being a reservoir held back by a dam, we think that, this, uh, that these forms that we're trying to figure through our projects um, can move through scales. They can move through the different sizes and scope of different projects in the, in the built environment and the natural environment. And then lastly, this third part is this idea of organizing programs in, in, in essentially catchment spaces. So if we look at that middle of this bowl, uh, the church, it has this kind of magnetic pull, uh, almost attracting people through gravity in a sense. And then there's a circ circumscribed area around the perimeter uh, that has a kind of limitation or an edge or a boundary that we're really interested in, in always pursuing in our work. This is the organization of the book. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, there, uh, we worked with John McMurrow and Stan Allen uh, to really try to think through these ideas. Uh, with Ellen Grimes, we tried to um, organize it in a way that made sense, uh, both from a kind of practical sense, but also a theoretical sense. And um, that's, that's where we'll start with this idea of dry, dry and wet. And this, this is a case study that begins the book. It kind of thinks about this idea of scarcity and abundance. And so we begin with this um, uh, idea of the uh, idea of the Aral Sea, uh, which is the fourth largest, you can see on the left here, the fourth largest inland body of water uh, at one point. You can compare it to Lake Michigan, which is the third, uh, plus its neighbor. And it's this really giant body of water. The, what's happened with the Aral over time is that because the um, political establishment essentially favored uh, agricultural growth over uh, the growth of a water-based economy or water ecology, it slowly kind of shrunk down. And the effect of this is not just a kind of loss of a resource, which can never come back, it's just too expensive to come back, but a highly polluted and toxic environment uh, that, that, that we can see when the wind kind of whips over the uh, empty lake bed, and again, this is smaller than Lake Michigan, uh, when, it, when the wind kind of comes over and captures all of the toxic metals, other kinds of um, uh, other kind of chemicals and um, uh, uh, things that we basically don't want our, in our bodies, pulls that up and then dumps it onto the agriculture that replaced this water body. So we compare that to this, which is a um, island called the Ascension Island. It's a desert, or at least started as a desert. When Charles Darwin uh, 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 traveled to it in the 1800s, same Charles Darwin, uh, that have effectively theorized evolution through natural selection, same person. Um, he got to the island, the, he talked to the British soldiers, uh, the Navy that was stationed on this island, and they basically said, you know, we have to bring in everything to this environment. It's, a, it, it's, it's desiccated completely. And he had, a, he had a thought that how can we steer this from, an, from a desert into a garden? How can we turn this into almost an oasis? So he mapped the island, uh, figured out where the different, let's say, infrastructural landmarks of the island uh, occurred. He started bringing in, uh, for dozens of years, plants and uh, trees from other parts of the world, especially in this botanic garden, Kew Gardens in London, and effectively created a kind of different type of ecology uh, through, the, through his efforts. And it was only through design, basically through a kind of artificial sequence of events uh, that created what eventually became a natural ecology that was very different. So today we see this um, basically garden island uh, that's self-sustaining. It creates its own water and food. Uh, and he also did it through a certain type of aesthetic intention that we're interested in investigating. There are three what he called infrastructural zones. So the top is this kind of cloud mist zone the middle is a, a sloped zone, and the bottom was a kind of agriculture zone. Uh, the effect of it is that there are these clusters of, on the top of the island, uh, microecologies that 
uh, produce uh, water, produce cooling, that grab onto clouds and make it rain. The middle part of the island is this inclined soil. He planted species that would uh, prevent erosion, and the bottom is agricultural land. And effectively, this is a kind of inverse of that dust cloud, that toxic dust cloud uh, in the aerial that was uh, depositing uh, kind of very serious chemicals. This one effectively just grabs onto the larger ecosystem and, and creates or grows its own resources. So why, why architects, why us think about things that maybe um, engineers might think of instead? Um, we think that as architects and landscape architects and um, urban designers, we can contribute to the conversation uh, through this idea of um, hybridizing architecture, infrastructure, and landscape, that if we actually insert ourselves more into the process of thinking about infrastructure, we can have a big impact. With these um, hybrids, combining these hybrids with cultural desires, we believe that we could produce design innovation. And design innovation uh, could then support, we're proposing, new lifestyles and new forms of collective association. So that's kind of why, why architects instead of engineers or in addition to our engineers. We um, have been looking back and kind of constructing for ourselves a kind of genealogy, a retroactive genealogy. Um, and Super Studio and other um, radical architecture groups from the 60s have really influenced us in how they uh, thought about productively leveraging crisis. Um, so leveraging uh, when Florence floods, um, leveraging infrastructure, these are all super studio collages, as you know. Um, so that's a kind of where we kind of position ourselves in terms of a kind of history. We also um, looked really closely at um, what it was that we kind of kept doing and produced a set of rules for ourselves. Um, six rules, actually we had eight, and Ellen cut two. <laughs> they weren't good enough. Um, but fit, but uh, rules like, um, that we, we kind of analyzed what we had and realized that like when we do a project that is a bowling project, it re, it's legible as a figure at one scale, a field at another scale, and then a figure again at, at a third scale. So that uh, these sets of rules we're proposing as a kind of way forward for perhaps um, uh, people to kind of think about how um, they might hybridize infrastructure, architecture, and landscape as well. Um, and a sort of really quick demonstration project, which actually doesn't really do too much with water, um, but is sort of a really short form of, of what we do in all the projects, and that is to kind of take what seems to be a kind of issue in the city um, and then think about how it could um, work better through design and infrastructure. And this is the current sort of situation around the United Center, uh, a kind of unmitigated growth of void space that's produced by a certain set of parking lots that then decrease property value around them and produce more void space. Um, taking one of the rules of kind of constructing a figure around the space, um, identifying what the underlying infrastructures are that can be leveraged, in this case, um, uh, parking and um, train and the, the United Center itself. Um, circumscribing it with a permeable uh, very permeable architecture, urban scale architecture, in this case a kind of aggregation of a variety of smaller sets of architectures which uh, lo are loosely based on um, the Chicago three flat, producing a set of mini figures that then get aggregated together in, term in some sort of larger uh, form that then circumscribes the issue, produces a kind of um, population in order to participate in, oops. Anyway, it was a cool image of how they were participating. <laughs> so, Buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So some of these projects, uh, or many of these projects, were commissioned and to begin with, although uh, in a sense they're all speculative in, in that they're planning projects, they're architecture projects that were um, really developed for ideas. So this is a project that was commissioned uh, by the um, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District years and years ago. Uh, and it's kept a life through the, through the, through the years. It, we brought it back to life at IAT recently. Uh, we worked with one of the commissioners of the water department, uh, Vedran Mimika and I uh, kind of worked on uh, this research agenda uh, together with a lot of other people at IAT. And it's come back again. So uh, we're working on this project right now in China. Um, so, so the way that we want to frame a lot of this is that even though it happened first, a lot of ideas came out of it, it they, they seem to come back and back again uh, in really interesting ways for us. So this, I'll just show you the first part of this, and then we'll talk about some of the later parts uh, just to, briefly at the end. So many of you have already seen this part, but we, as Chicagoans, pull out about a billion gallons of water a day from Lake Michigan, and we renew less than 1% of that, very small amount, about the same amount that a desert naturally renews on its own. Um, so then we're combining that problem with this other problem of a lack of dimi or diminished manufacturing opportunities and jobs in Chicago. So this is an old story nationwide. Uh, over 10 years, we lost about 5.5 million jobs in the nation. In Illinois, about 300,000 jobs. And in Chicago, about 200,000 jobs. About the same number of people that left Chicago in that 10-year span, uh, according to census data. So what do we do about it? So we worked with the water department to think about how to turn uh, water that we have in abundance uh, into jobs, effectively, uh, into a kind of uh, new way to treat um, natural resources that we have. So this is the site that we originally worked with. It's on the south side, near the wastewater treatment plant that you can see on the right. And the effective idea is to pull that water uh, into uh, the site um, and effectively give it away almost for free uh, to any industry that wants to relocate in Chicago to create jobs. So industries spend billions of dollars a year on water. It's scarce. It's contested. People go to war over it. The idea is if we can corral those businesses into Chicago, which we have plenty of the water, and by the way, if we put it right back in after we use the water, we basically create this loop that creates jobs and doesn't really um, waste any resources. So this project is all about thinking about ways of doing that. We came up with the idea on the lower right there to have this central uh, space in the middle of the project that would effectively capture um, all the rainwater. So this is the, just a photo of what I'm talking about in case you don't uh, know how wastewater works in Chicago. We use it, it goes to the wastewater plant, and then it flows out through a river down to the lake, down to the Gulf of Mexico. And this is about 150 million gallons a day that you're looking at, about the same as the LA aqueduct, as this LA aqueduct. Um, so it's really just tossing aside a really valuable resource that some cities, uh, are, it's their lifeblood, effectively. Without this, LA doesn't grow. So then we um, take that middle zone, which is the stormwater uh, dot, effectively, which is public space. Uh, we design it as a bowl so that it can flood because we have no wastewater or stormwater infrastructure in this entire area. Um, and then we reconfigure the industries around this dot to take advantage of all of these resources that, that, that we have. From an architectural point of view and in uh, meeting infrastructure, we're trying constantly to uh, manage the way that the architecture interfaces in order to um, create these hybrids, as Sarah is talking about, but also to create a kind of incremental and, incremental and flexible system so that it can be uh, built very slowly but very surely. Um, what's happening now with the Chicago Water Department, um, Metropolitan Water Reclamation Department, is that the Ford plant is gonna be the first one to start to do this work in this loop, and that's an existing building. So slowly, new buildings will come online in this, in this area, we hope. Seems like it will. Um, and uh, we hope that the architecture responds to the landscape that is pushing and pulling water around to a landscape that's public and that operates like a campus effectively uh, so that there can be more public space created that leverage the dollars that are gonna go into building 
what otherwise would be a very capitalist, almost gated community type of, type of establishment. And then we consider in a very speculative way um, what other kind of secondary co-beneficial programs could be inserted into the, into the fabric of this, of, this new, of this new system. And so uh, we're always really interested in playing out the scenario of the hybridization of landscape uh, architecture and infrastructure. Um, and also kind of asking a what if of, what if, like, what if you actually could um, uh, work and play and live nearby a kind of new type of public landscape that would uh, support um, a variety of, of both jobs and um, lifestyles. Um, and so we don't leave, you know, maybe how we might be distinguished from other projects like this is a kind of trying really to tackle the, f the form of it at, at the same time as the kind of logic behind it. Um, and again, sort of really questioning um, how we might produce the effect of, of this hybrid within uh, the city itself. We started actually this whole kind of 10 year odyssey of thinking about water um, with a project that um, began as a competition for a reality TV show, which is crazy. Um, like all reality TV shows have, you can either turn into president or you can make a book. Um, <laughs> well, what was learned by this reality TV? So they, they hired uh, five architects in New York, five architects in Chicago, five architects in LA. They gave us one week of non-sleep time to come up with ideas and they filmed us the whole time. We were delirious by the time the five days was over. They were constantly kind of putting competition uh, type of uh, protocols onto us. They effectively selected a winner, but then uh, and, um, we, we eventually won it all. But what they decided, they called us two months later and said, you know, we did all that. You, all your architects are boring. There's nothing here of interest to the general public. So And they never aired it. Yeah, yeah. They never aired it, yeah. <laughs> it's too boring. But that's, that week we realized, we actually realized kind of the, the, the potential of uh, this, this kind of general, um, this, the region and the kind of abundance of water. You would think we would have known that already, but um, the kind of book is also sort of set up as both a kind of the first half is uh, projects about water abundance. The second half is about projects of, uh, with water scarcity. And so this is the project that kind of started us on this path of understanding the abundance, but also the craziness of Chicago in amongst the abundance, in that we're the only city that, as Martin mentioned, takes water out of the Great Lakes and doesn't put it back. Um, and we've done this by um, basically reorganizing the watershed, the Great Lakes watershed, and connecting it, physically connecting it through a series of canals to the Mississippi watershed. And we take water out and we don't put it back. And so this project was um, trying to work within the larger system of the city, uh, the grid of the city to take, uh, to still use just as much water as we'd like, but to actually try to figure out a way to put it back. But at the same time, putting it back uh, through the network, existing network, but in order to put it back, we wanted to leverage that and to create new public space in this new zone of, of collecting water. So we came up with a series of programs that could work well with um, collecting and cleaning water. And these are all landscape-based programs um, like fields and courts and um, playgrounds and um, proposed those every half mile a street every half mile would um, take on this new c set of configurations, adjusted according to density and a kind of amount of water produced and, and, and discarded um, to create um, this new network um, in which every inhabitant in the city would be a quarter of a mile at the most, basically 10 minutes away from the amenities that are most often found on the lakefront and only available to people who live along the lakefront. So this is kind of dragging 
the lakefront amenity through the city from east to west uh, so that sort of everybody uh, has more of a connection to it. It's probably worth mentioning that we were doing this project for Mayor, um, for Mayor Daley before he stepped down. And a couple of these did get built. Um, and they're pretty interesting, but the promise of them never really got uh, totally uh, enacted, let's say. And it was a real shame that um, that, that that program never really uh, developed. There were nu numerous people working on this together. Um, so we'll show in a couple of minutes this project as we've exported it to China, which seems like will definitely get built in a different way, slightly different way. After that, we, you know, after the series of um, near misses of trying to produce those types of landscapes throughout the city, we thought about perhaps what was missing is the kind of uh, iconography of the project um, and a kind of point-based system. So we started looking at what would happen if we didn't have to rely on the overall grid of the city, but we actually went super local. Um, and to look at if we actually distributed a kind of confetti of really tiny uh, water treatment plants throughout the city, or at least starting in a neighborhood, or starting on a block, could we produce uh, amenity program, new lifestyles for a super local um, moment, um, but also to kind of create an architecture that um, could insinuate itself into the city and, and, and change the way people sort of interact with infrastructure. Um, so we thought about something that would only take up two blocks, I mean two parking spots in a block, um, and always be kind of commingled with a, a non-water or exactly non-water um, program, like um, bus stop or uh, food kiosk, or maybe a kind of more publicly or oriented water program like a pool. Oof, never mind. Um, and that these would be uh, infinitely um, malleable in order to kind of create difference across uh, the landscape. So not, not they would all be different uh, potentially. And you could say I, I'm near. I live near the um, flat-topped one versus I live near the bulbous one that's pink. Yeah, I mean, there's what we believe is that there's a lack of visibility of infrastructure that effectively makes people not care so much about it. And when people don't care about it, especially Americans, uh, when we don't care about something, we don't want to pay for something. And when we don't want to pay for something, it just kind of creates this cycle of mismanagement, but also um, effective, eventually gets back around to affecting our health and our quality of life. Uh, so a lot of these projects are about trying to figure out a way of producing a new type of visibility that really deals with matters of concerns versus matter of facts and matter, where, where matter of facts are just completely wrapped up in a kind of engineering um, embargo against architects having any kind of influence on the way infrastructure is designed. We think more about matters of concern in which uh, all of us can get more engaged in these kind of conversations that aren't closed down to a very uh, proprietary type of approach uh, to all, all of the funds that flow through to infrastructure. Did you want to finish? Um, and there is our kind of imagination of how these um, little point-based um, mini water slash program architectures would live in a neighborhood. So when Sarah Herta uh, came to our office a few years ago as she was um, thinking about the first Chicago Biennial, she I think you called it a studio visit, something like that. She asked, well, what do we want to do? You could do anything, she said. Give me a proposal. And then the, she would either accept or decline the proposal. And one project that we always wanted to work on was the um, issue of the river and trying to solve the problem of um, how it operates in the city and how it can become something like a actual part of people's lives uh, in the city. And so we kind of started down this path, uh, just picking up on some of these other projects, where we started research into just thinking about, well, what happens with this rain, in these rainstorms especially, and how do they operate? What we know for sure is that when it rains too hard, these uh, promote or propel uh, something called combined sewer overflows, which are effectively these moments where 
Sewage gets shot into the river, then into the lake, and then produces this very unhealthy situation um, that um, really has always happened in Chicago. And we've always been spending money on infrastructure, not really to prevent this, but just to mitigate some of its uh, effects. And, uh, but this is all while really trying to, uh, let's say, do our best. So this is the, the river. This is when it's just full of sewage. It, the, the locks get released when there's too much rain and it just flows out. And when we do a basic calculation, we learn that one out of every 25 flushes goes right into the river, then into the lake, on average through the year. So it's quite significant. The other thing we learn is that the city is spending billions and billions of dollars to dig a couple of holes or a few holes in the ground um, that purportedly will hold uh, water before it has a chance to flood the lake um, and uh, place it into these giant bowls uh, to process it later. And you can get a sense of the scale of these things. It's just gigantic. And you've probably flown over this to, to see it. It's one of the largest infrastructure projects in the world. The problem, though, if you can look down on the bottom there, is that's where that reservoir is, way far away from the problem. Uh, so we're effectively spending all of this money to um, try to solve uh, something that is happening that most people don't even think is going to solve the problem. So what to do about it? So our idea is why not place the solution, the design, right where people could use it most and try to double up uh, on that funding to try to produce co-benefits, things that we really also want or need. So we call this the Filter Island Project. Um, in the book, we um, kind of show the basic relationship of this little local problem as it affects the entirety of the country uh, because it effectively is just the, the beginning of the of a problem. And we um, come, we basically came up with a solution that, well, we don't see much here. Okay. Do you think it's loading it? Yeah. We're stuck now. Hold on. Okay, that's okay. We have definitely an image at the end where we can show. I don't want to press the button too many times. Okay. Um, what it is, uh, we'll show you this image first. Uh, so what it effectively is is this giant landscape that uh, catches the river water before it has a chance to um, enter the lake, and it filters that water as it moves through all of these different cells which have different kind of microecologies in them. And these cells, they look a little bit like this. Um, they have these different functions in them filled with microbes and plants that essentially metabolize our waste for the purpose of um, detoxifying all of the, all of the pollutants in the, in the water as it moves through. So we built this model for the, go ahead. Um, but at the same, what we uh, aren't able to show you is a, a set of um, programs that range from a kind of ecological patches to cultural patches, we were calling them. Which, yeah, here, which, um, so I'm doing both in that they both uh, clean water and it also um, produce uh, landscapes for people to inhabit. Um, but the idea that, that infrastructure can be leveraged to produce new public spaces may be most clearly demonstrated here in which, uh, where you have both at the same time a, a huge public space. Um, uh, broken up into a variety of, of programs that would be uh, desirable by people in Chicago, and at the same time cleaning water uh, at this, at, in the same space. Um, so if you're going to spend so much money on cleaning water, how about you know giving something, have, having everybody benefit from it more directly? Mm -hmm. So. The book, as we mentioned before, is divided into, into kind of two halves, the first half being a kind of set of studies on water um, plentiful landscapes, and the second um, looking at the southwest of the United States um, where everybody wants to live, but there's really no water. Um, and looking at, at this sort of really kind of crazy radical idea of uh, Aqueducting water, uh, seawater, vast distances, 
because they're doing that anyway, um, but actually producing new ways to live along these new aqueducts and the result of where the water is being aqueducted, which would be into these kind of endoric uh, bowls throughout the, the region. Um, water scarcity diagram, it's bad. Um, with the idea that uh, if this is a, a crisis of our time, how can we as architects productively, again, leverage this, insert ourselves into the conversation um, uh, in order to envision uh, things that perhaps haven't been envisioned yet. We notice that there are a number of potential bowls in the southwest that can hold water. Uh, looking back into the long history of moving water and moving other goods and services through linear um, ur infrastructures like aqueducts and comparing um, our a proposed one to other ones which are much more extensive. It seems crazy, but just crazy enough to work um, that perhaps you could take vast amounts of water and uh, as Charles Darwin did, kind of reorganize small sets, uh, small zones in the Southwest to produce new uh, microclimates, which would then also be uh, uh, livable. And so here is a collage that we made kind of as an homage to a super studio collage. They're also sort of looking at um, not exactly the same idea, but um, putting ourselves kind of in that vein um, and really drilling down into what these new possibilities might be. We um, made this model for the second uh, Chicago Architecture Biennial which we kind of like re-imagined uh, Super Studio, um, and then uh, sort of egotistically inserted ourselves here into their landscape um, with our own aqueduct. Um, but what it leads to is not just an aqueduct, but it leads to the possibility of new urban and suburban form. And so we looked at three uh, ways that people generally like to live and reimagined them based on this new possibility of this new infrastructure and public space. The first is a kind of a idea of, of a town. Um, so it's a kind of a, a, one, a one street light sort of town. It's got the main strip, which is the aqueduct. It can um, uh, be read as a figure at a larger scale and also um, a field at the medium scale and a set of figures at the smallest architectural scale. Um, and it kind of rethinking of American style zoning, to think about it sort of in a three-dimensional way, in set up a few rules in which uh, a kind of center space must always connect to that public aqueduct in order to produce a new um, covered, shaded uh, outdoor space in which the town sort of, the town square becomes uh, uh, shaded. Um, we produced, working through these ideas through model and drawing um, and looking at a kind of multiplicity of lifestyles that might be possible um, and looking at really taking it as seriously as possible in terms of architecture. Uh, another way people like to live, obviously, is in cities. We looked at um, producing a kind of city density along the aqueduct um, and what uh, might be possible uh, there. Um, we looked again at the very small scale, the architectural scale of the kind of aggregated elements um, to see what new possibilities might be and um, cribbed from the best, like Corb. Um, and re, uh, aggregated to see what might be possible in terms of both public and private space. Um, again, kind of testing through um, drawing and model. And then finally looking at the suburbs and reimagining the suburbs um, with a new uh, underlayment of a kind of farming community 
um, which would take advantage. Um, obviously, California and, and the states nearby produce quite a lot of agriculture already, and they use water to such an extent that other uh, parts of the population aren't able to have enough. Um, but here, we're looking at ways to kind of um, layer both agriculture and the suburbs to produce a kind of gigantic mat building um, that has a kind of uh, agricultural lower level and living upper level um, and looking at what the kind of architectural possibilities might be for that. Again, looking at the sort of small scale of the architecture and re-aggregating it out into the urban, the architectural scale, scale to urban design. And then again, always kind of trying to ask what if, like what if you, what if this were a reality um, and what types of lifestyles might be supported, like John Wayne herding goats. So yeah, when we do these research projects, we're always asking ourselves, how can we anticipate uh, the potential of architecture as it meets these larger systems or even the smaller scale systems? And then all of a sudden we got this chance starting about three years ago to work on these really large scale planning projects uh, in China. So we're just gonna show you one. Um, this is the scale of it if, in comparison to uh, Chicago. Uh, it's about 17 square miles or so. And the, yeah, so we'll, we're gonna just turn on a movie uh, that was the original concept. And we've been working on this for a couple of years now um, and started as a competition, which we won. Then, it, um, then we got paired up with the Chinese Institute and we're just working on it. But effectively, this one takes all the growing water research and uses it in a site that's gonna be, uh, that's gonna be built. So the reason that we got asked is because this is one of the largest freshwater areas in China. It's in the middle, in the Hunan province. The city is called Changde. And their interest is in making sure that they both don't flood and they have plenty of water to drink. So there's these two ranges of too much and not enough that we we're after. So what we proposed to them was, first of all, to really make sure that the orientation of the city revolves around their main resources, which are these three lakes. And those lakes are uh, effectively fed by these three mountains as they uh, straddle the, the river. And then there are these three districts. Ours is in the center of this new town. And this will be a new city for about 750,000 people. Uh, this is the transportation. Very little of it is there. There's some old city fabric that's 2,000 years old, but this is, will be an entirely new uh, in, uh, insertion into effectively a green field um, that, is the current, that is the current site. So right now, that little weirdly shaped lake in the middle is this um, uh, runoff area, very polluted, very toxic. So what we wanted to do is make this case that we can think about water as both an economic driver, as an environmental driver, social driver, even part of their critical identity of a new city because they need to get investment um, very uh, through the national level and local level. And that this new water body can really become the center of all of the activity uh, around which all of the new development happens. So current conditions is that when it rains, not different from Chicago actually, uh, the water, stormwater picks up all of these pollutants, dives into this lowest part of the site, which is this uh, 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 um, ditch, essentially, large ditch, and that water then pollutes the next people in the lake. So we take our eco boulevards that Sarah described and place them as the kind of foundation of the infrastructural program of the city. And effectively, it would just make sure that whenever it rained, that water would be cleaned, absorbed, uh, in, uh, before it entered this large body. Uh, the way it works is very similar to the way it works uh, even in Chicago with the couple that have been built, is that it has a lot of co-programs, a lot of co-benefits. In this case, though, what we wanted to explore was how do we make this also the main public space of the city, of this new city? And how does this main public space interface uh, with all of its qualities with the main technical function of the city, which is to prevent flooding, and also to make sure that that main body of uh, water in the middle is, um, is healthy for people and can even be used as a water source. Uh, we also make sure that from a just general quality of life issue that this um, uh, main central water park then becomes a 
Central Park. And all of our concept originally was that all of the major buildings, both commercial and cultural, should be in this water. And this is just hooking up to uh, a partly existing walkable ecological spine in the city. So the way it works is that the main eco boulevards are uh, getting fed by secondary small roads. Um, They're just feeding all of the stormwater in because there's not a big sewer system here. It's punctuated by large public spaces or these sponges that absorb water in very intense downpours. And then we specified all the private property uh, to have that also work within um, the public property. So what this is showing is a kind of three-dimensional uh, view of just what it might look like. It's not really scaled to be China. We took a lot of the dimensions from places like the Ramblas in Barcelona. And then the public sphere, which are these large buildings here, also operate in the same sponge. So this, that will be a part of the public uh, expenditure. And just to end here, um, we also just wanted to make sure that the um, walkability was uh, operational. All of the public transportation will uh, effectively be within walk, easy walking distance with, from all of the main roads. We created a much smaller grid, a much finer grain grid, to make sure that um, even the architecture would benefit from not being in giant, mega-scaled gated communities, which is effectively how internationally things so much, so much gets done now. This is part of the propaganda that we had to put in where the national government just makes sure that this investment is worthwhile, being in the center of the industrial um, hinterland almost of this outlying western um, uh, uh, area in the city. Uh, so, yeah, we can just yeah. hold off. Yep. And then we just wanted to end with one more project that is built that just tries to test some of these ideas also. Oh, it's me. Um, so this, the, the orange that you saw in Changde is now tested at this scale, at a scale of a, of a small school on the south side of Chicago, uh, where we were asked to um, uh, rethink their outdoor landscape. Um, and we tried to rethink it through a kind of um, infrastructural and architectural and landscape um, lens. Um, thinking about how to kind of, uh, since we had to deal with quite a lot of water, how we could actually um, do that at the same time as um, produce a kind of new space for uh, the children. Um, this is the kind of infrastructure that goes into um, maintaining all water on site rather than what normally happens, which is you connect into the sewer system. Um, and this is then able to produce this, which is the one of the, the landscapes that we proposed and built at the school, um, which is a kind of big collective space where you can get the whole school on this ribbon, as well as the amphitheater, um, and have a kind of community uh, of the students. Um, so maybe sometimes when we kind of get overwhelmed with uh, uh, the sort of scale of the very large projects. We always want to try to bring it back to the scale of architecture, always. And this was a kind of opportunity to really test um, what these hybrid landscapes could be uh, in, at a very, very small scale. Um, we, have, I, we have kind of recurring ideas of, of certain types of figures, certain types of uh, topography, which um, we keep testing and trying to, to get built. Um, and this was a very small test of how that can actually happen. That's it. OK, thank you very thank much. You. <laughs>
So we do know what the first question is, because it always is the first question, <laughs> which is, what about architecture? Uh, shouldn't, you know, why leave out the architecture? Why not include some of the built projects, um, which in a certain sense are the progenitors of uh, a lot of these um, larger scale projects, I suppose. Really, really what happened was that when we built um, a project that where we wanted to have the entire building off of the stormwater grid in Chicago, we tried to get that permitted and it wasn't allowed. It wasn't legal to do that. And that really started us down a path of trying to figure out uh, what the problem was. And we had this opportunity to, um, that's also where our relationship with Mayor Daly began um, because he saw us present one of these things, but then he, then we told him that there's this, uh, that none of the stuff that we wanted to do with him originally was, was, was legal. None of it could um, be built. It would all be denied by the, by his building department. And I think that that was really where, uh, together actually, we worked on a couple of projects uh, with him in his office, people in his office, who are, who are uh, um, still pretty important people in, in the upper administrations of parks and other places in the city to try to reverse this, this um, problem that the definition of what infrastructure can be is very tightly organized. And it's organized in a way that, um, in a sense, preserves a lot of the conventions that have been going on uh, for a long time. But they're all modernist conventions. They're, they're not really preserving the best ideas uh, in the history of architecture, let's say. So some of what we're doing is sort of um, um, thinking through uh, the legacy that we effectively have uh, given ourselves uh, in contemporary history and trying to rethink how those can be instituted in a slightly different way, definitely through the eyes of architects, though, through the eyes of people who would like to use form and aesthetic intention to create very visible infrastructure projects. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about unintended consequences. So um, you guys are so excellent at your rhetorical strategy, both visual, especially visually, um, presenting the, the, these grand proposals as a series of kind of like observations, strategies, causes, and effects. And so it all ties together very neatly. But what's interesting is that the situations you're looking at, like the reversing of the Chicago River, right? They were trying to solve a problem, cholera and waste. They came up with a solution. But now, of course, it comes up with all, all, there are all these unintended consequences, like the, the arena. You know, you create an arena. It's a bowl. It's a collective space. It produces this, like, shock wave of parking. So. I'm curious, not even practically, but let's say rhetorically or conceptually, is there some place in your process or in your office where you wrestle perhaps with the, the potential of unattended consequences in let's say a new island in the middle of the lake or any of the other projects? Yes. <laughs> Uh, but maybe, you know, it's uh, a, lot, I mean, a lot of the projects in the, well, all the projects in the book are, are unbuilt so, and, and probably will always be unbuilt because they're a little bit insane. Um, uh, but I think it, we, we feel that it's like better to think the projects through and try and then see, try to play out what the unintended consequences, what, what happens if you actually build a kind of spongy wall around, around that um, stadium, does it completely transform the neighborhood to the point where people in the neighborhood can no longer live there? That's definitely a thought. Um, uh, but I guess we have actually in one of the essays sort of talk about all of the problems that infrastructure planning produced from the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and they, they did produce a lot of problems, but at the same time, you can't not respond. So there would be unintended consequences. We would attempt to kind of like make, you know, do our best to kind of think about them before they happen. Um, but I guess it's inevitable 
that there would be unintended consequences, but we do think about them. I think the, the rules that we made, the six rules that we made, try to overcome some of them. So for instance, uh, the rules are about, in, in one of the rules is that um, we embrace dumbness. Just the idea that something can be so simple, like radically simplified to the point where all it is is gravity, the sun, you know, um, all of these conditions where we don't need to maintain anything, it maintains itself. Uh, there's not a lot of energy needed to run it. There's, um, people are gonna use it without having to uh, go out of their way in a sense. And I think that part of, um, I mean, th these are very naive and amateur type of comments, but that's how we try to operate as, um, as kind of amateurs that want to uh, try to figure out the, um, uh, the root of the issue without, over, over, um, without using a lot of technology to solve it, but then saving the technology for architecture, saving it for something that is, instead of a kind of soft solution, very hard, solid solution, which we feel is, um, you know, people always ask us, well, why, do you, why is everything you do boxes and things? It's because we believe that architecture should be this, this, this very solid thing that doesn't um, apologize for doing whatever it's doing because if the rest of the environment is being um, kind of foundationally sensitive, I guess, to the, to the surroundings in every way, then the architecture actually can behave in almost any way that it wants to because the architecture is not really the foundation of the unintended consequences typically. It's usually a bigger system that, that, is, that is going haywire. Um, and so it's, in a, in a way, I think it's almost an excuse to, to leave the architecture alone and not let it um, try to pacify any kind of necessities that deal with sustainability and like all these things, which we're not that interested in. Um, and so we're trying to push that off onto other systems and have the, the unintended consequences not really be there. But maybe it is with the architecture. Like unintended consequences with architecture, I think is actually interesting uh, because they could be good unintended consequences. Um, I really appreciate um, your um, lecture and you know what you also are doing at, um, at the school. Um, Alexander von Humboldt had the idea that um, the, the world is one big place and uh, it's a skin and when you think about the skin of the earth, um, then you can, in a natural way, uh, understand what we have to do at particular places. So when you, when we, uh, so when we, for example, look at um, at Venice, a city which we all know is extremely connected to water, and the, the, the city, in a way, is is uh, destroying itself at this very moment. When you look at um, Europe, at Holland, for example, where we we live with water, and we understand that when we do something, we build an island in front of the sea, we do it, not for one reason, but for 20 or 30 reasons. So my question is, is this. Um, at the moment, we don't take as a country or as a kind of a, a global consequence that water is one of the most important uh, features we have and we have to, to take care of that. Um, and that's, that's I think, what, what your lecture is, uh, is about. The, the question, however, is that the problem is on such an on, on such a incredible scale that what you present to us today, examples or what we could do. But we, I think one step further would be um, understanding, and maybe that's something I would like to ask you, <laughs> that, that's a, the question, how can we, um, instead of Giving, a, giving examples or trying it on, a, on the scale of, of Chicago, um, what would be the, the next step for you to take it on a, on a much bigger strategic uh, level? I think this, this should go on the level of, on a, on a higher level. Mm -hmm. how, how can we achieve that? Because, so my question is more or less, in Holland we, people, every single person understands the consequence of water, because when we, when we stop pumping the water out of our country, we die. Um, so 
people have to understand till the, 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 the smallest part of our bodies that we are in need of your ideas. And, but how, how can we take that on, a, on, this, on this bigger strategic level? I think mm -hmm. I would like to, to, uh, you to elaborate on this a little bit. Yeah, we've been thinking about that as well. <laughs> um, we, you know, we, we've tried hard to kind of uh, test some of these ideas in this country and um, uh, find that maybe other places are more receptive to them. Um, and perhaps if, uh, when or if the, some of those projects come to fruition, it would be easier to kind of say, well, here, it worked. Um, but that might be one of the issues of kind of uh, how does it work and does it work? Um, we feel that like as architects, what we could bring is the possibility of envisioning or visualizing what the, the possibilities could be, which is somewhat different than uh, someone who's completely involved only in the technology. Um, but I guess it depends on uh, these crazy systems that we that we work within, and how do you kind of reach any kind of consensus on these issues in our current political climate? It's quite difficult to imagine. Yeah. So um, first of all, I was told never to talk about water to any Dutch people because they know more <laughs> than us. Um, but, but secondly, the way I think about it is when um, we got invited to. Um, join a UN United Nations panel on water a few years ago. We walked in the room, or I, th I think, I, I don't know if you were there, walked into the room, and um, there were two things going on. One was that on one side of the room were the corporations that use a lot of water. On the other side of the room were all the environmental nonprofit NGOs who were trying to conserve, preserve, you know, really deal with not um, all of the unintended consequence problems that Marshall was talking about. And the only person in the middle that I thought anyway was the architect, you know, the person that says, let's leverage it uh, for some kind of economic activity and let's preserve it, let's conserve it through, through some kind of design, through, through really designing the systems or designing the architecture around it so that everybody's happy. And so I think from my perspective from that question, which um, uh, is, is really interesting, I think, is that we, I think we, the big we, have a viewpoint or a point of view, I guess, that's a little bit different from everybody else because we want to get things, or we, let's say, want to be involved in projects that are built that do some damage to the world, but we can also design our way out of the, that damage and even make things better. Uh, and I, I think that that's what we have to contribute uh, to these bigger problems that so many other people are working on. But if we want to insert ourselves in, I think that's, that's kind of the point that we, can, that we might be able to do it. Yeah, the, the, oh, yeah. the UN commissioner for the water was Willem Alexander, the prince of the Netherlands, who is now the king, right? Mm -hmm. So he's now huh. busy with the kingdom, yeah. our kingdom. <laughs> but my question is really your kind of play uh, through your practice and the book between a kind of uh, 60s red radicalism and the current or future, uh, you know, situations. And uh, as, as you know, it all started somehow in Florence with, you know, Andrea Branzi and Adolfo Natalini and, uh, you know, Superstudia and, uh, and Archizum. Uh, this is how one can almost read your two submissions to the Biennale, and the last one being basically uh, the Brancian space, uh, the way in which you deal with a certain operational utopias of the 60s. Now the question was, as, as Martin, you mentioned, that we really worked with Deborah Shore. Mm -hmm. She is a commissioner for water in Chicago with one, $1.3 billion budget. Mm -hmm. And the question is how this budget could be sort of employed into the way in which you treat uh, the, the multi-functional infrastructural projects, where actually the budget for, let's call water, enters into the budget for urban renovation, urban building. 
building, uh, urban, um, let's say, redefinition of the territory. Uh, would you believe that could be possible in a foreseeable future? Yeah, it's, it's, it, we're working on it for sure. And that free water district project is the one that we're almost copy pasting to some degree, at least at the beginning, into another project in China that we're working on right now in the office. And the idea is essentially uh, developed by Deborah with just us as, um, you know, uh, with her. And we're eff effectively trying to export it um, in this 23 square mile new space that doesn't have much to it yet to see if um, w that budget maybe can be spent somewhere else. <laughs> but I think you're right about the, the, the mentality of how we're doing it. So our project at the biennial this year uh, the Super Studio project was these two things coming together. It was, Super Studio was interested in how we can live very modern lives anywhere in the world. So this grid that they, this un, uh, grid that they placed on the planet, um, extensive grid, is really just about providing some way to tap in or plug in anywhere and still lead a modern lifestyle. We paired that with Stanley Kubrick's, I don't know if anyone's seen this, but these little monoliths. And those monoliths are uh, artificial life. There are these artificial um, computers that were placed in these environments, so the story goes, to steer the inhabitants in one way or the other. And they steer them at critical points uh, in their development, uh, theoretically. The evolutionary, artificial, evolu artificial evolution, essentially. So we always think we're putting those two things together. We're trying to steer in a very artificial way uh, but in the end, try to make it livable. And we're trying to create this kind of uniformity uh, where um, we think things have to be plugged in and those things that have to be plugged in are architectural. Uh, they're not just anything, let's say. Um, and so I think the way uh, you, you know, we approach Deborah, other people, is to try to convince them that multiple things can kind of come together at these points Yes, they need a certain kind of um, ambition by somebody. Uh, and it might be a, a politician, it might be a, somebody else. But it does, that, that's our argument for sure, is that we are hopefully can help provide those kind of moments where things can turn around. Jonathan had a question. Oh. I was just curious about the yeah. two rules that you cut from the book. Um, if you'd be willing to share them with us, because perhaps there are unintended consequences. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh no! <laughs> Ellen can probably remind us. Uh, <laughs> She's shaking her head. This sounds like a great time to get a drink. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs>